It's not week one anymore. It's barely week two. We're on to week three. You know what that means? Dial in. We're talking week three waiver wire pickups, waiver wire ads. And we're going to do the same thing that we did last week because y'all loved it. You love the format. We're going to jump onto the sleeper platform. They've got the trending up. They've got the trending down tab, which tells us basically the most engaging fantasy football players right now. Who's getting picked up the most? Who are dudes that we can drop? We're going in on everybody. First, you know what you got to do. I came tucked. Say a little prayer to the Bijan Robinstein gods. Flex them. Let's see. All right, so we're on sleeper here. They've got trending up here, trending down. And the way this is ordered, this is not in terms of like the best waiver wire pickups. This is just raw number of pickups for a certain player. So you could see Josh Reynolds tops the list. You're obviously not putting more fab dollars down on Josh Reynolds than you are Kyron Williams, but it's just saying he's had 410,000 pickups over the last, whatever, 24 hours. I'm not sure what the actual metric is. Whereas Kyron has a lot less because he's higher owned. So a lot less people are picking him up. So we're just going to kind of go down the list and talk about it as if they're, you know, in tears or, or whatnot. They made you cry last week. We'll make sure that we pay for it. Josh Reynolds, He's a cool little safety valve for Detroit. He's like one of the few downfieldish playmakers for him right now. When you look at like Sam Laporta, he's doing his best TJ Hawkinson impression where he's catching the ball for like six yards and then falling down. Uh, Amon Ra is obviously a stud. We have Jameer Gibbs coming out of the backfield, nine targets. But again, like they result in 30 yards. They're not downfield targets. They're not the same type of targets as Josh Reynolds. How long does he last? Probably until Jameson Williams and Reynolds probably becomes the three. But for now, you can see getting a lot of snaps, 70%, 80%, six targets minimum, six 60 yards, 80 yards. I think realistically he's popular play now because he scored two touchdowns, but I think he's got a nice floor of, you know, eight to nine PPR fantasy points. He'll probably put up 40 to 50 yards. He's just going to get a lot of targets in an offense that is going to throw the ball a lot because they can't really stop other teams. Montgomery's a little banged up. He's got the thigh bruise. I don't really expect him to miss too much time, if any. So if he does miss time, they're going to have to throw the ball a little bit more. But Josh Reynolds is okay. He's, he's not like overly exciting. This list overall is not the most exciting list. And we will talk about the trending down players too. Uh, guys that I would for sure let run away from for my team. No questions asked. A lot of these dudes are very highly owned. We don't have to talk about Kyron Williams, 63%. We don't have to talk about, I don't understand how Puka's on this list. I guess it's such a high volume of players or people adding them that they get on this list. But like, this is how I know this is typically because you listen to fantasy podcasts nowadays and they'll bring up like Puka's still available in 60%. Like, shut your mouth. Why are we resorting to that bullshit ass type of content? The way I look at this, the way I would adjust these ratios, not that it matters for you guys, because all you got to do is look at the little yellow thing here. And if it's a dub, that means dub for you because they're available in your league. But the, the Puka should be the most owned player of all time in fantasy football at this point. He should be the most owned player ever. But he's available in 19% of leagues, which tells me 19% of leagues are dead leagues. So you can kind of tack on that 90% to any of these numbers. And that's probably more closely correlated with how many leagues that player is actually rostered in. And I bring that up so that I could tell you, like a preface, I'm not going to waste my time on guys that are 60, 80, 70% owned, whatever, in this type of content. Guys like Kyron Williams, guys like Puka, obviously, guys like Raheem Mostert. How the fuck is he on this list? Or on this list? And I, I, I will get some questions. Someone uh, asked me today on a YouTube video, they were like, hey, DeAndre Swift is on my wire. How much fab should I put on them? The way I look at fab is if, if there's a player there that has a ton of upside if there's a player there that you know is going to be startable for a long period of time for your week like a real viable starter for your fantasy team there's no limit on dropping fab fab is i don't want to say fab is like worthless but you'll pick up like two to three usable players throughout the year and as long as your league allows you to put a zero dollar fab bid which i think almost every single league does you'll still be able to pick up players and use them when you're really in a time crunch so what i would say to that guy who asked me about deandre swift you're sending it. So even if Swift ends up being like the RB24 over the next 15 weeks of the season, that's worth the fab that you're dropping on him. As opposed to guys like Josh Reynolds, as opposed to guys like Fat Zach Moss, who are going to be fill-ins for like two weeks, I'm not dropping 100% of my fab. But guys who can legitimately be difference makers in your lineup for an extended period of time are priceless, baby. They are priceless when it comes to fab. The faboratory gets emptied. So Kyron Williams looks so legit. He was in on 97% of snaps. He's running a shit ton of routes. He's getting the goal line carries. Another guy you empty the bucket for if he's on the list. Matt Breda is on here because Saquon Barkley is dealing with an ankle injury. I think they just said it was three weeks. I am filming this around 6 p.m. Eastern time. 
Monday night. So there will be Monday night football still to be played. All right, quick interruption because it does look like we needed to wait to watch Monday night football in order to do this video correctly. Uh, there were some, some running back injuries. Unfortunately, Nick Chubb's leg did its best impression uh, of a Twix bar. Not great. He's going to be done for the season at his age. It could it could be a, I'm sure we'll see him. Actually, I don't even want to put that on the record. I don't know. Nick Chubb's out for the rest of the year, so we'll talk fantasy. Jerome Ford was the guy who came in after him. Jerome Ford was his, you know, handcuff going into the week. Jerome Ford is an explosive straight line runner. We saw that on his big breakaway play. He got tackled at the one yard line, would have had a much bigger day. Ended up catching a, a pass from Deshaun Watson as well. He is very easily clearing away the number one waiver wire pickup of the week because there are no other real contenders here. You are placing yourself into an offense that uses their running backs heavily, an offense that produces in the backfield. They will give Pierre Strong a little bit of run, but Pierre Strong is like new to the team. He came over at the end of the summer. He is a, a change of pace back for now. Jerome Ford has the size. He was a dude who at Cincinnati, you know, obviously he benefited from having the GOAT Desmond Ritter as his quarterback in college open up all types of holes. But Jerome Ford is a uh, straight line runner. You give him openings in the hole and he's going to hit them and he's going to go far and he's going to go far fast. I don't think he's that creative as a runner. I don't think it's going to matter with the type of volume that he's going to get. So Jerome Ford seems to probably be a nice little RB2, maybe RB20-ish in that ranking range with upside for sure on a weekly basis uh, in your lineup. So you're blowing the fab on Jerome Ford here. Jamal Williams ended up pulling his hamstring a little bit and did not return to the game. I don't think they had another running back active besides Tony Jones Jr., who scored twice on the goal line. Kendra Miller was not active. Maybe he gets back next week. I wouldn't blow anything really on this backfield as it stands, except for this little one-week fill-in. We'll have to kind of keep an eye on reports to see if Kendra is back. Even if he is, this has been a prolonged absence, so I don't think they're going to give him a huge workload off of missing multiple weeks. So it seems like it's probably going to be Tony Jones's backfield, but Tony Jones is just another NPC name to add to the list of fantasy football waiver wire NPC names. Out of control. And we're one game away from Alvin Kamara coming back. He's got the three-game suspension. There's been two games. Do the simple math. One more, and he's bite. So maybe you get like a flex plug-and-play for the Saints in the backfield in week three. They go against the Panthers, so that is uh, a pretty nice matchup. We just saw the GOAT, Bijan. We have so many GOATs on our team, it's unbelievable. We just saw the GOAT, Bijan Robinson, absolutely dice them up, cut them up like some fucking onions for a saute. Could be Tony Jones Jr. Probably not, but it could be. I would throw, I don't know, a couple of dollars on Tony Jones, but don't. let's not get extravagant here. And I'm sorry, I glossed right over this. I'm an idiot, but Taysom Hill is a huge beneficiary of this. Ran nine times for 75 yards. Was used down by the red zone. Was used down by the goal line. And if he's their main, I wouldn't even be surprised if he ends up being like the main running back and leading the team in carries next week. So Taysom Hill, depending on what kind of eligibility he has on your fantasy platform, I'm not actually sure off the top of my head. So depending on all you guys probably play on different platforms, drop the comments down below to help other people. What eligibility does Taysom Hill have on every platform? Sleeper, Yahoo, ESPN, CBS, NFL. Drop them all down below. Because somehow I come to you in the year of 2023, Taysom Hill, again, fantasy relevant. That's really it from a Monday Night Football waiver wire angle. So as of right now, all we have on Saquon is that it's probably three weeks. We'll see if they put them on the IR, if they expect it to be four weeks. So it's like, who fills in at the running back position? It's going to be some disgusting mess of Matt Breda, maybe like Gary Brightwell, the rookie Eric Gray. I don't really expect any of them to have any sort of like high upside games. I do think it'll be some sort of a split backfield between them. So I really wouldn't empty more than like, I don't even know who I'd want to go after. I guess I would go with Matt Breda because he is the backup there and he did come in after Saquon, but he's pretty small. He's pretty fragile. He's a dude that I could see giving carries away too to Gary Brightwell. They might want to see what they have in Eric Gray, who's a healthy scratch. So maybe they don't give a shit about what Eric Gray is. It, it, it's gross. I, I like maybe you go for Matt Breda, but I wouldn't put more than like two to three percent of your fab on him thinking that you're going to get like a starting running back because that shit ain't happening. Nico Collins is someone that you kind of empty the bag on. I think one of the reasons are he's getting such high target numbers. He's not even playing like a full full time role. 70 percent of snaps in week one, 62 percent of snaps in week two. 11 targets, nine targets. They are downfield targets too. They are like big, valuable type targets. I think a lot of it is because Stroud has looked like he was advertised, accurate, but he is facing a ton of fucking pressure. The Texans are down four offensive linemen. Tunsil, Titus Howard, uh, Juice 
Scruggs, uh, Questenberry, like they're down four or five offensive linemen, four of them being starters. So Stroud is living under pressure. But Stroud's been relatively good given what he has to work with over there. So they get down as a team early and often. So they throw the ball a shit ton. He almost threw the ball 50 times over the weekend, which leads to a lot of targets for Nico Collins, for Tank Dell, who we'll talk about in a sec, for Robert Woods. All these guys on Houston are getting volume. And CJ Stroud is about as accurate as a quarterback as they've had since, you know, prime to Sean Watson. So they're going to have fantasy production in PPR type leagues. Nico Collins looks like a bona fide fucking wide receiver three with upside. It's not available in a lot of leagues. So again, I said I wasn't going to waste my time, but let's continue wasting our time on guys. We said we weren't going to waste our time on Zach Moss. Zach Moss, apparently the savior of the city, the savior of the Indianapolis Colts. Everybody knew that he was going to be the guy. They're acting like he is Jonathan Taylor. I don't understand it. It blew my mind, but so did the hundred percent touch rate. He got 100% of the running back touches. Goal line, 18 carries, 98% of snaps, 88 yards on the ground, scored the touchdown, four targets, four catches. I mean, good Lord, Zach Moss. But again, we're two weeks into the season. Jonathan Taylor, still still a question mark. Is he going to be with the Indianapolis Colts? If he is, that means he's only going to miss two more games. The Indianapolis Colts play at Baltimore. They play the LA Rams. They play a very tough defense in the Tennessee Titans. So not great matchups for, can I, I feel disrespectful calling him Fat Zach at this point because he played so well yesterday. He's not someone I'm overindulging in when it comes to Fab. He will be like a low-end RB2, high-end RB3, probably just based on the touch volume going forward for the next couple weeks. So if you badly need a running back, I'm not I'm not against throwing like, I don't know, 8 to 12 percentage, but even that feels a little gross when I get to the end part of that. I, I don't think there are any running backs on the wire that I feel comfortable enough putting the number one waiver wire on like Kyron's not really available in any leagues. Zach Moss, you got to be super desperate to use your number one waiver wire on him. Raheem Mostert's not available anywhere. Uh, DeAndre Swift realistically is not available anywhere either, despite me getting questions about him. Yeah, there are no real running backs that I think I would. The one that r is super fucking intriguing is for sure Roshan Johnson because Deonta Foreman was a healthy scratch. Kind of interesting that Deonta Foreman was a healthy scratch and still Roshan Johnson's snap percentage only went from 39 to 42%. His overall involvement did not go anywhere. I think it's really tough to identify like the game plan of the Chicago Bears. They kind of just feel like all over the place and everything that happens just happens by luck. Like it feels like nothing they're doing is calculated. Uh, and that also relates to the backfield. Phil Herbert's still the clear starter. They made Deonta Foreman inactive because they had, I forget who it was. They have another running back that plays special teams and that's why they played him over him. But Roshan Johnson, it feels like clearly is now the RB2. If they felt otherwise about Foreman, he'd be playing over him. But Roshan's a dude who's obviously clearly pretty highly owned. But if he's still available, he should, he's, he's one guy I would consider using the number one waiver wire on only because second half of the year upside I could see being very he's looked like the best running back on the Bears that doesn't always translate to getting the volume it doesn't always translate to fantasy production but I will say he feels like the type of guy who could have a big second half of the year so I'd be hesitant to throw the number one waiver wire on him but if he's on there with fab I, I would definitely throw between like 10 and 15 percent on Roshan and and, and occupy a bench spot for a, a, quite a while with him those are those are really the only, only running backs I feel like worthwhile and, and worth talking about maybe when we get down to the bottom of the list we'll talk a little bit more about like Craig Reynolds and, and that NPC dude but let's 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 actually talk about probably my favorite waiver wire pickup of the week assuming those top guys are gone Tutu Atwell man Tutu fucking Atwell I didn't give this guy enough credit in terms of like what his involvement in this offense was going to be and I don't I think I speak for everybody when I say we didn't give Sean McVay enough credit for just being a phenomenal offensive mind they heard the chirping man they heard it was just this it was just this all summer and you know what Sean McVay did like the fucking baller he is he just put his head down put the hater blinders on and got to work the dude retooled the offense. Stafford's looking, mm. their offensive line somehow isn't terrible like we all thought it was going to be. They've made Kyron Williams into an all-pro player. But more importantly, like, sure, Puka is the story here in their receiving group. But even more, more importantly, is the Sean McVay 11 personnel passing offense is back and well alive. Do you remember how electric this group was when it was Cup, Robert Woods, and Brandon Cooks? 11 personnel, 95% of the plays. This is what they're reverting back to right now. Right now, Puka is in the cup role. Right now, Tutu is in the Robert Woods role. And when Cooper Cup comes back, they'll just move down the list. And Tutu Atwell fills in for Brandon Cooks pretty fucking well. He's a field stretcher, down the field kind of guy. He's winning in man routes. He's winning zone routes. 
eight targets, nine targets. Hasn't got in the end zone yet, but 119 yards, 77 yards, six catches, seven catches. He feels legit. Everything about this Rams passing offense feels legit for the time being. As long as everybody's healthy, I feel like Tutu will be the B there to Puka's A until Cooper Cup returns. Then the pecking order obviously changed a little bit. But I, I see Van Jefferson being the odd man out, and Tutu is proving everything about that. Tutu would be, based on the percentages here, I'm trying to be like realistic about what real fantasy leagues look like right now. Based on the wide receivers available, based on what this looks like, Tutu, very likely my number one pickup on the week. Weird to say, but I, 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 I can't imagine you've been watching football the last two weeks and you're not bought into what Stafford, this system, and this personnel looks like. Tutu's running 95% of the routes. He's on the field every single down, and they're using all their wide receivers on every play. And it's Tutu and Puka, and Tutu and Puka, and Tutu and Kyron and Puka, and Tutu and Kyron and Puka. That's got a cool sound to it. Tutu and Kyron and Puka. Great names. Just great names out there in LA. You think they're real? You think those are stage names? Tutu, Kyron, and Puka? Those feel like fake LA Hollywood names. I'll give it, I'll give it to the marketing team over, over in the Rams department. Who else we got at wide receiver? Marvin Mims made two monster plays, obviously, for the Broncos. The problem is he's running no routes. 27 and 24% of the snaps. This is this is like the perfect... I, I, if you can encapsulate fantasy football in, in one picture, it's this. He ran more routes last week, had the same number of targets, and we wanted to drop him. He does the exact same thing the next week, and he happens to catch two Hail Mary passes down the field. Now everybody's back in on him. He's one of the most added waiver wire pickups of the week. He's still running like the fifth most routes. Jerry Judy is back. He ran 85% of the routes. The Fantasy Life website has an awesome free tool for you guys to use and for everybody to use. This is not a, this is not a paid plug whatsoever, but this shit is free. You usually got to pay for this kind of thing. And if you look at... Game log under utilization report. This is on fantasylife.com. They have week one. They've got week two. They've got the routes percentage. Corlin Sutton's a full-time player. Jerry Judy in week two was a full-time player. Little Jordan Humphrey, his playtime went significantly down after Judy returned. But Brandon Johnson, whoever the fuck that is, is playing 60% of the routes. Marvin Mims down here. Like he's literally tied with Philip Dorsett. What are we doing out here? He's like the fit. And, and I get it. I understand making big plays and like being good at football tends to be the thing that gets you higher routes and, and higher snap percentages, but he's still sitting there. So you're going to tell me you feel comfortable about Mims being in your lineup. Definitely not, but you know, maybe more big plays to come. I don't really know. He's not someone I'm overpaying for. Tank Dell is kind of interesting, though. I talked about Houston, and I talked about their receiving core. Nico Collins is definitely the one there. Robert Woods feels extremely secure in a PPR-type format where he's probably scoring like 11 or 12 points a game. They're going to have to throw the ball a lot. You see his snap percentage go up from 48 all the way to 79. He's making some big plays down the field, got the touchdown score. Tank Dell was a really exciting college prospect. It felt like every time you watched him play in college, like smaller school, he was playing in like gym class against these much lesser talented dudes. Does that translate over the entirety of the year? I don't know, but I'd be okay picking up Tank Dell and kind of seeing what happens over the next you know month or two, seeing if he continues to play 72, 75% of the snaps, if they're running three wide receivers all the time because they're always down then Tank Dell will probably play a lot. So I don't know. I, dro I dropped 2 to 3% on him, nothing more than that. Zach Ertz, again, continues to eat. We'll, we'll wait on tight ends, actually, and keep going down the wide receiver bandwagon here. Jaden Reed continues to be a really, really awesome playmaker for him. He was a, he was a big dynasty target of mine this offseason. The rookie second rounder continues to go under the radar that he was a second round pick there. Snap percentage, he's still playing just the slot role. He's still playing slot type snaps, 55%, but he scored two touchdowns, 20 fantasy points in this one, half PPR. With Christian Watson still sidelined, Jane Reed, is he's a good playmaker, man. But again, like don't be too fooled by touchdowns because if he doesn't score the two touchdowns, then you're, then you're looking at a pretty pedestrian day. I like Jane Reed. I like him in deeper leagues, 1%, 2 3%. See what his role looks like when Christian Watson is back, but not eager to get him to my lineup right yet. A lot of kicker action. Kansas City Chiefs defense with Chris Jones looks fucking phenomenal. And Chicago is on their schedule next, so KC is probably the pickup of the week at defense. Allen Robinson, we'll see what he does in Monday Night Football, but I think the guys to keep an eye on in Monday Night Football. So we have Pittsburgh versus Cleveland. Allen Robinson and Calvin Austin, for sure, they're probably regularly available based on Deontay Johnson's injury. Uh, Jalen Warren, probably pretty owned, but we'll see what his split percentage is with Najee. On the flip side, Cleveland, I would look at Elijah Moore and Amari Cooper definitely own. DPJ could have a big game maybe, but still there's no predictability with him. Jerome Ford would probably be like the one guy I keep an eye on because he got like 15 carries last game, although it all came in garbage time. So when Nick Chubb wants to go Chubb, 
he gets chubby and Jerome Ford will stay off the field. So maybe he's the handcuff probably doesn't really matter. That's the only, those are the players. The players I'm really looking at in that game would be the Pittsburgh receivers with Deontay Johnstein out. Who else? Salvin Ahmed, no. Brandon Johnson, no. Robert Woods, I've talked about. I think he's just flying under the radar as a, as a good PPR play. I'm gonna, I'm sorry. I'm going to skip past all the dudes at really high percentages. Calvin Austin, definitely keep an eye on. Latavius Murray got one goal line carry, split it with Damian Harris, who got a goal line carry. Uh, we're not really looking to grab him. Craig Reynolds would be the guy, like, he literally has such a fucking NPC name, bro. Like, who are you, Craig? It's 27. Went to Cutstown. Shout out Cutstown. So David Montgomery banged up his thigh. Now, he said, he said, it's going to take a couple weeks for my thigh to heal. My, he's got a thigh bruise. Everyone took that as he's out for weeks. That's not... That's not what he said. I don't know why people ran with that. He, the way he, the way I took it, the way he said it, I think was that like he's injured and it's going to take some time for him to get back to hundred percent, but that doesn't mean he's sitting out. So maybe he misses a week. I doubt it, but it could happen. If that's the case, Jameer Gibbs will probably get a few more touches in the run game, but he'll be really involved from a passing perspective again, I would imagine. I don't really want anything to do with Craig Reynolds. They are playing against Atlanta, but Atlanta is a team that just eats up clock. We just eat up clock. We're just born for greatness. The Super Bowl this year runs through Atlanta, and you can't tell me differently. 2-0, and people are saying we're the greatest 2-0 and team of all time. I didn't say it. People are saying that, though. Who else we got here? A bunch of bums. A bunch of bums. All right, so tight ends. Uh, we'll work our way back up the list. Hunter Henry, two back-to-back two big games. Mac Jones is throwing the ball. They're letting him spin it a little bit when they get down, which I feel like wasn't really the case last year. This is These are good numbers, man. These are these are great numbers for a fantasy tight end. 6'5", 56, 1, 7, 6, 52, 1, running a shitload of routes. He is like the tight end one there, clearly. He was, he was really good a couple of years ago. Mac Jones was really good a couple of years ago, and then he fell off the face of the earth. Maybe, maybe this is actually what he is and not whatever that was last year. A lot of what the Patriots did last year is probably not what anybody in the NFL is. That was just a shit show of life there in New England. So Hunter Henry's like sneaky, definitely getting up there in like the tight end one, you know, uh, atmosphere. Zach Ertz was another guy I put on your guys' radar last week on the same video. He's just getting a sh an unbelievable amount of targets. 10 targets last week, only turned into 21 yards, but he upped it. He upped that production. Eight targets, six catches, 56 yards this week. They get a tough matchup against Dallas. But, you know, there could be some some volume to be had. I'm not, I'm not going to say production. I'll just say volume, and you guys can choose to do with that what you want. But Zach Ertz is, for whatever reason, he's back, and he's getting a lot of fucking targets in that offense. Jake Fergie, only 29% owned. He did find his way into the end zone, but he has back-to-back -back games of 11 yards. Hate to see it, but they do play the Cardinals. The Cardinals have been notoriously awful against tight ends for for years now. For years now. Waller just had a pretty good game against Arizona, so Fergie, maybe he bounces back. Uh, Brandon Cooks banged up a little bit. I still like Fergie. I'm still on him. It's probably it for the tight end position. Let's move over to the trending down tab, and I can kind of tell you whether or not I would keep these players or cut them. Now, Josh Kelly, one of the biggest droppers of the week. I get it. He had a bad game. A lot of y'all probably started him, has sour taste in your mouth. But again, it was one of the things I echoed on the Sunday live stream. It was like I liked Kelly because he was surefire going to get volume. But he's very similar to Jamal Williams. Very similar play style, very similar player. And the Titans absolutely ate up Jamal Williams. And the Titans' run defense is fucking elite. So Josh Kelly is who he's going to be. He is that secondary piece in the Chargers run game. So when Eckler gets – I expect – Plenty of good games from Kelly still. He is, you're 100% holding on to Kelly. He's he's still going to get work in that offense. He's still going to be the number number two behind Eckler, but the t Tennessee Titans run defense is super legit. Cam Akers, not great. I'm going to hold on to Cam Akers for like one or two more weeks and see where he lands if some team wants to trade for him. I could see him going to Baltimore. I could see him. I just don't even know if he's going to be good anywhere. That's the problem. I would hold on to Cam for another week or two. Odell, I you could drop his ass. Kendrick Bourne, I'd probably hold on to. He's a dude who's getting a decent amount of targets. So 11 targets week one, nine targets yesterday. He didn't have the production. That felt like the most obvious fucking four for 30 game of all time coming after his big week one game. But I still think he's probably one of, if not like their best receiving option. Quentin Johnson, you could definitely drop right now. He's like fifth in the pecking order right now. Deion Jackson, absolutely drop fest. Higby, who would have seen this shit coming? Zay Jones, that's unbelievable that he's on this list. Unbelievable. He was two inches away from two more touchdowns. He's tied. Like, this is ridiculous. If someone, if Zay Jones was available in your league, he would be my number one waiver wire pickup for the week. So do not let that man drop in your league. Van Jeff, I got no interest in. Piran should be owned for sure. 
Don't know, Mooney. He's got the knee bruise. I'm not really interested in that Chicago passing offense outside of Darnell. Zeke, it's whatever. Lazard, whatever. Dalvin Cook, oh, God, he looked bad. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not ready to drop him because they were playing against Dallas, and I feel like that game script was the most predictable thing of all time, but let's keep an eye on that one. Juju, absolutely droppable. Rashad Penny, for sure, droppable. Tyler Algier, definitely not droppable. I'm sorry. I'm wasting my time on dudes that are like 80% owned again. Let's see. Ooh. Uh, Rashi Rice is kind of interesting because he didn't do shit in week two, and I, no one's really doing anything there besides Travis Kelsey now. Sky Moore had a relatively big game, but it was kind of like a broken play at the end that really racked up his yardage. So I, I'd hold on to Sky Moore, but I really have no allegiance or attachment to any other Kansas City uh, skill player outside of Sky Moore, Isaiah, Isaiah Pacheco, and Travis Kelsey. Tank Bigsby, an awful, uh, not a good week, too. Didn't play at all. Didn't really play at all. 19% of the snaps after a 21%. They just don't trust him there. He looked he looked really bad in week one, bro. He looked like uh, – he just looked like he wasn't ready for the spotlight. He was jittery. He was – the ball kept falling out of his hands. Like, he, he was just not ready for it. <sighs> Do I want to drop him yet? Let's see what happens in Houston. Let's see what happens in Houston. I, I would hold on to him for one more week just because they can get up big and the game script can just go to their running back. So, I'd hold on for one more week and kind of see what happens before I drop him. Devon A. Chain, uh, no use for him right now. Dobbs, I'm holding on to. Mitchell's a handcuff. Who else? Uh, Justice Hill. Justice Hill's a dude that I liked him over Gus Edwards, and I still do. He outtouched him. He outsnapped him. He ran more routes. He actually got the first crack at the goal line, didn't get in, and that's where the problems arose. In the first half, he outtouched Gus Edwards like 9-3 to three or 9-4 to four or something like that. He got stuffed at the goal line. The very next play they put Gus Edwards in, Gus got in. And that was the problem. That's where Gus started getting more work. So Hill, Hill and Gus just kind of are who they are. You know, they'll continue splitting work, and you can't really trust either of them as more than like a low-end RB3 at this point. I'll hold Bateman. I'd hold Gibson. I'd hold Herbert. I think McKinnon's probably droppable. What the fuck is this? What is Jahan Dotson doing on here? Uh, Zach Charbonnet. I kind of want to hold him just because, like, if Kenneth Walker were to get hurt, he becomes the number one pickup on the waiver wire immediately, right? Whereas I don't know if you say that for everybody else. Like, if Gus Edwards goes down, do is Justice? Do we feel confident in Justice Hill? Like, eh. If Brian Robinson goes down, I don't even like Antonio Gibson that much. You know what I mean? So, uh, Zach Charbonnet, I feel good about him if Kenneth Walker were to go down. So, I probably hold on to him. Gallup, you could drop. Foreman, you could drop. Thielen, you could drop. Drop it like it's hot. Sutton, I'd hold on to. That's about it. All right. Well, that was week three waiver wire pickups. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel. We'll be doing a trade target video tomorrow did enjoy it as well make sure you stop on the way down there hit the button that looks like this let's just know you like it and we will continue to do these week in and week out i love you i'll see you tomorrow